Recently, someone inside the Girls Twiddling Knobs podcast community asked me a great question. Is there a playlist for the podcast where people can check out the music from all the past guests? And I said, no, but there definitely should be. So we got to work over here at GTKHQ, and I'm delighted to share that the Girls Twiddling Knobs podcast playlist is now live on Spotify and is waiting for you to dive into right now. Whether you're curious to find out more about the wonderful women we've featured on the podcast so far, desperate for some music production inspiration, or committed to diversifying your listening material, this is the playlist you've been waiting for. Check it out right now at the link in the show notes. Hey Knob Twiddlers, I'm thrilled to share that season three of the Girls Twiddling Knobs podcast is sponsored by the lovely folks at Isotope. Now, Isotope design award-winning audio plugins, and I'm actually using some of the fabulous tools inside their RX9 software to get my voice sounding crystal clear inside today's episode. And when you use the code GIRLSPOD10, you'll get 10% off any plugin purchase on their site, excluding subscriptions and a whole free month of their amazing Music Production Suite Pro instead of the standard seven-day trial. Just go to isotope.com forward slash girls pod to find out more. You know, it's really important for us as an organization not to get lost in a conversation that's an echo chamber. We need to be reaching people that actually we need to reach. Otherwise, there's no point for us, actually. We know the problems as women that we face in the music industry. What we need is for other people to understand those problems. And if we can't speak to, to other people who potentially might not even realize they are part of the problem sometimes you know it's a societal problem it's not just within music but I think that within music there are just so many power dynamics at play that give individuals so much perceived power that we have so much to to take down and to, to get into so we can't we just can't have the conversation on our own we need to make sure that other people understand the problem. Hello and welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs. My name's Isabel, and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female-identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Welcome back to another full fat, no artificial colorings or preservatives episode of Girls Twiddling Knobs. Want sides with that, dear listener? How about a nice big helping of deep fried sage advice on the side too? And Knob Twiddlers, it's with a heavy heart that I'm bringing you the last episode of season three. I know, didn't season three fly by? And what a season it's been. I mean, the guests have been phenomenal. Whether it be hearing about making house and techno with DJ and producer Emily Nash, designing elaborate sound design systems for Broadway with Jessica Paz, being one of Gary Barlow's in-house music producers with Charlie Deacon Davies, or collaborating with Vibrators with Sen and Peeler, We've had some fascinating discussions this season on the podcast. And that's just scratching the surface. I haven't even mentioned our deep dives into imposter syndrome, signal chains, owning the title of music producer or sound treating your recording space. We have chewed on the big topics too. But before those tears that are building up in your eye sockets actually gain full momentum and hit the cold hard floor beneath you, let me reassure you that... Season four of the podcast will be with you before the year is out. And boy, do I have a totally engrossing, jam-packed guest episode for you today, dear listener. And without giving too much away just yet, something we're touching on today is creating safer spaces for women to get their music recorded in. But maybe you've been thinking about having your own safe recording space at home. Wouldn't that just be the ultimate gift to yourself as a musician? A space you can walk into whenever, wherever, even if it's just in the corner of a room, that's your creative refuge. And if that's something you've been inspired to create for yourself after listening to the podcast, you'll have also picked up that I teach the importance of sound treating your space 
over-investing in lots of fancy recording gear when you're just starting off. It's easier and cheaper than many musicians think, and luckily for you, dear listener, I've put together a simple, free, three-step guide teaching you how you can do this from home. Just head to femalediymusician.com forward slash learn with Isabel to grab yours now and get ready for recordings that will instantly sound more professional, even if you don't have a big budget. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash learn with Isabel and grab your three-step guide today. But on with today's episode, Knob Twiddlers. Now, the role of a music manager can be pretty tough. Not only do you have all the hopes and dreams of your artists weighing heavy on your shoulders, but you also do all the hardball industry negotiations and career strategizing too, none of which you can ever be sure will actually work out. But on top of this, today's guest, Vanessa Threadgold, had also faced an even bigger challenge throughout her career as an artist manager how to protect her female artists against studio environments that were, at best, unwelcoming and, at worst, downright exploitative and abusive. Inside this episode, Vanessa shares how this question led her to co-found Cactus City, a music studio and social enterprise helping women to have safer studio experiences and more opportunities to build a profitable music career too. And if I were you, dear listener, I'd get a pen and paper out quick because, trust me, when you hear the advice and insights Vanessa's sharing in this episode, you're going to want to be taking notes. She has such a wealth of experience managing artists in the industry and then also setting up her own business, but she's also just such a warm and thoughtful person too. I know you're going to get so much out of what she has to share, so let's meet Vanessa. Well, welcome, Vanessa, to Girls Twiddling Knobs. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad to get you on because I love Cactus City and what you're doing. And I really think that the listeners to this podcast are going to love it too. So we'll hear all about that. But first, can you just introduce who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Vanessa. I founded Cactus City in 2018. It wasn't intentionally a commercial project, actually. It was because I was an artist manager at the time. And uh, it was a response to a need that my female clients had. So I've been doing that now for for four years. But in 2020, we founded as an organization. So it was a recording studio initially and then became an organization which was dedicated to making other spaces safer as well. So yeah, that's what I do. Fantastic. So maybe we'll just start by um, looking at your journey into music sure. um, before we get into exactly what Cactus City is and what you mm-hmm. do. How did you start? working in music? So I've always been a creative person. I actually studied performing arts at college. So I didn't do A-levels. So I've got a, I've got a law degree, but I didn't do any A-levels to get into it. I've got a B-tech in dance. So I have always been a performer. I've always been a, an arts teacher. And I think it was about 2012, I started songwriting with a friend. And three years into that, she started writing lots of songs that were really suited for herself and I encouraged her to go and pursue an artist career because she was really really strong great voice and it was clear that that's what she really wanted she just hadn't brought it out of herself yet so she asked me if I would manage her which I agreed to and I said look can you, can you move to London let's do this thing properly I'll start a company and we'll we'll do that and it just kind of just snowballed from there really I ended up with loads of clients including Sally who's my business partner now um, she'd just come off the voice and she was looking for a female fronted management company yeah that's how the journey happened I think it's, that's quite a natural journey and I think it's it emulates quite a lot of people's um, journeys into the into the business I think you sort of start managing a friend and then it ends up being something that you actually really love doing and I don't manage that person anymore unfortunately she doesn't do music anymore but it left me with this amazing career that I actually love. So, you know, I'm pleased it happened. Yeah. So did you not expect at all that that would be the career you'd go into then? So in 2012 as well, that's when I started my law degree. So I'd just finished dance. Well, I hadn't finished dance teaching. I decided I wanted to change of pace. And also my mum was getting a little bit stressed out that I was traveling all the time. I'd be away for like months at a time dancing around the world. So I thought, right, let me go get a degree. My brother's got a biochemistry degree. He's about to do a master's and I'm here with my dance B-tech. None of that's a problem. 
but I thought I want to help her ease her stress a little bit so I did a, my law degree fast tracked because I really didn't want to do it um, I did it fast track so I did it in two years instead of three and at that point I thought maybe I will go into law because I've always been interested in the legal profession so that's always something I've always been interested in I thought maybe I'll go be a lawyer that's that's pretty safe so <laughs> potentially and then it was when I was working in sort of mediation and negotiation that I realized that I needed the creative side still I really really needed it so I started working towards making that a full-time occupation really I think after having sat at a desk for two three years I ended up working in in corporate for five years I think it just really just it wasn't me it wasn't me it really wasn't and don't get me wrong I spend 95 percent of my time now doing like admin and and legal and dealing with accountancy etc but that 95 percent of the time is to support that five percent of the time that I'm doing something that I absolutely love so I can't I, I don't feel like it's work even though it is the stuff that I really don't like doing yeah no that's really interesting to hear like your journey and 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 it just goes to show that people have so many different facets to their personality, their identity, so many passions. And, you know, you can kind of start with dance, move into law and then end up where you are now. And obviously you're still young Mm. and all of those things can work simultaneously and complement each other at different points in your life. I'm sure that there's probably things from your dance um, training that help you now, you know. Completely, completely. I think if anything, that just working with creatives and understanding, you know, how they are, they're generally more um, sensitive than the average member of the population. And and also understanding that, you know, the how the industry is, still the entertainment industry, you work alongside each other and you had to work in, you know, we, they made us do crew stuff, tech stuff as well, just in case you found yourself out of work. So we had all those other elements of training and that, that really did help. And it really helps with discipline, actually. Yeah. You have to yeah, be very, very dance, disciplined. You have to be really disciplined about keeping mm-hmm. your body okay and, you know, practicing and making sure everything's working. Like a singer, you know, mm-hmm. like a singer would you, that's carrying all of the work that you can do as your mm-hmm. body and, and making sure that's in good condition. Yeah, it was, the discipline was a lot. The, the early classes, I was dancing seven days a week, sometimes three hours straight, um, yeah. just, just to do the conditioning. So it, it was it was intense and you had to go. I I mean, I remember I was really, well, not really young. I didn't start dancing until I was 14 actually, which is quite late, but I really wanted to do it. But my dad didn't want me to because I was academic. He really wanted me to go down an academic route and his car was once in the garage and I walked for three miles as like a 14 year old to get to the class for 40, for a 45 minute class to then walk back just because I really wanted to be there that I didn't want to miss my my class and they cost my dad like five pounds an hour or something so I didn't want him to be wasting his money either um so you ha- it does really instill that discipline in you and that helps in business as well because you have to be so disciplined to keep going absolutely and you have to I mean, we were talking before we went on on this call. You have to have that faith, don't you, that you're going to put resources in up front and you don't know how or when it's going to be paid back. And Mm -hmm. the same is true with creativity. You have to put time and energy and sometimes even finances in Mm -hmm. and you don't know how or when that's going to get paid back. And the other thing I was thinking of, you know, with dancing and performing is having that experience of collaboration and really working as part of a team and, and kind of relying on that team to make something come together and that that must help having that background with what you do now at Cactus City, because obviously you're, you're part of a team and, and you mm-hmm. have to make sure that those relationships are, are kind of in, uh, are in balance and flowing mm-hmm. and that you can listen and you can respond respectfully and effectively. That synergy is so important because it's, you know, the communication, like it is like choreographing something, but that's not, always moving at the same time and in the same way but you still have to have that almost invisible connection with the other members of the team sometimes so say we've got um, people working in the the copy and the the blog but then they have to work in synergy with the SEO they have to work in synergy with social otherwise it's not gonna 
it's not going to tie together. And then they also have to work in synergy with the actual projects that we run, because the reality is the reason that we have all this, you know, all this marketing is so people can come to us and we can actually help them get into careers where they are paid. So that's our end goal. And that's our that's our purpose, actually, as an organization is to make sure that women and gender minorities are supported within the music industry into actual paid careers. And that's that's our main focus is people can monetize early and they can monetize efficiently. So, you know, all those things that we have, we have a great TikTok, but it, we wouldn't think that that was the end goal based on the TikTok, but that's just to draw people in and then they have yeah. to be in synergy with the rest of the team and keep moving through the, through the body of Cactus City, I guess. So it does, it just definitely does help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, just kind of thinking about your journey through music then before Cactus City, what were the things about managing managing artists and being in that environment as well with other industry professionals what are the things that I that on the one hand really lit you up that you're like wow this is amazing and what were the things that were challenging so it's always the moment when you've got the song I think that is the big moment for me because you can make so many songs and some they're, they're good, but it's when you get that great song that you can listen to over and over again. And when you're in the studio, you just hear it, you know, slight mix, you turn it up a little bit and it starts to come through the monitors and that this is, this is the one that like we've actually got one here. I think that moment is one of my favorite moments in music. And even if it doesn't come for months, because sometimes it doesn't, sometimes people hit um, lulls, that moment really keeps you going. Cause you just can't, let go of that moment I don't think I think and and I have so many songs as well on my hard drive that the world might never hear because the artist might never release them because they don't want to do music anymore but I get to hear them so I'm like oh, okay well at least I get to hear them I'm okay with that I you know I'd like the world to hear them but it doesn't always work like that and also you get to hear some of the biggest songs in the world way before they come out as well and you just know how you know it's going to be a hit I actually don't think that it's rocket science knowing when a song's going to be received well because I think we hear songs, we hear songs on adverts, we hear songs on the radio, and we just know that's going to do well before it's done well because you can just tell. And I think that's the thing that really does light me up with um, the music industry. And then I think the challenges are balancing and helping people balance their mental health. I think as a manager, a lot of the time we spend um, as a counsellor and understanding how important that is and trying to counsel artists through these difficult times and get into them to that realization that potentially them having a successful music career won't help that actually can we unpack that a little bit actually Vanessa because I think there'll be lots of people listening where you've just said something that they they feel inside like oh oh that's me you know Mm -hmm. or or that 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 matters so let's unpack what that is so I think I see so many young artists who are, you know, they are struggling. They are struggling with their, their happiness. They're struggling with their satisfaction. And they see what they think is a successful music career. And when I say that, I mean being famous, having millions of, you know, millions and millions of streams, millions of listeners, doing big big stages, headlining. They see that as the ultimate success for themselves, winning, winning awards. But one, that's such a, I suppose, old way of looking at stuff we are now in a space where you can be a very successful independent um, artist you could potentially be making more profit than people who look like they're doing really really well so one reframing success is really really important in people's minds and it takes time especially now because people are so focused on their stats people are so focused on constantly doing well constantly going viral and we have to really reframe that and say well what does that mean because are you monetizing that virility are you actually getting a core fan base or you're just relying on big numbers and then also just generally just them understanding that you actually have to work on yourself as well throughout the course of this and actually driving from a happy place and driving yourself from being happy you're gonna do better generally and you can't reach happiness just by reaching those goals you that happiness isn't a destination it is the journey and if you aren't enjoying the journey you can't guarantee that that end goal is going to then make you happy because it, it, once you get there, it actually will be a passing moment. It's not forever. Things have to keep coming to to keep adding to that if that's what you're basing your happiness on. So it's tough because people drive from this space of fear. So you have these. I don't know if you've heard of the the drives that the drive 
centers in your brain, how your brain works. You have your compassion, your drive, and your your fear center. So your compassion is like your soothing center, and that's, that's where a healthy human brain would live. And then your unhealthy human brain lives in like this this fear space, and that that fear space is actually a really primitive part of the brain, um, which was designed for like running away from I don't know woolly mammoths or whatever. Like it wasn't designed for for modern life. That's not that's not how how you know it's not where we've come from we haven't i don't think the human body would understand that we were going to have computers and we're going to live in the way that we do now being connected to millions of people so easily but if you drive from that space of you can do this this isn't this doesn't define you etc like you're actually driving from a, a happy place rather than if you don't do this you're going to be a failure and you're driving from that fear it's not going to suddenly stop because you've gone somewhere I couldn't agree more. And and I say that as someone who's felt all those things you just described, you know, and I think as an artist, you get so used to at, at first music for many artists is the thing that genuinely does soothe them mm-hmm. and genuinely does help them uh, unpack what's going on mentally for them, emotionally process stuff, be the thing where you feel alive and present and understood. But then when it moves into something that is then hanging so many other things hanging in the balance related to it like your sense of self-worth and your income and your network and you know your standing in the music scene and etc etc and your sense of rejection and when all of that stuff starts to hang around it because you've you know spent so many years doing gigs or whatever or you've done a music degree or whatever it is that you've invested into this career that's when music then can start to be the thing that like you say is is coming from that fear center rather than music is my refuge music is almost like my my tormentor or my you know my uh, kind of like a ball in a chain or a whip or something where you're constantly chasing this trying to not feel scared anymore that you're failing or that you you're messing everything up or that you've missed the boat or you know i think women really suffer from this because even though it's getting little by little better, I think that we know that we don't have the same kind of opportunities. Yeah, completely. And we don't have the same doors open to us. So then there's that, like, it intensifies that fear so mm-hmm. much. And I know that for me as an artist, like my last album that I released, Chalk Flint, the whole time I was releasing it, I really didn't enjoy it. I really didn't enjoy it. Whereas I'd really enjoyed releasing all three other albums. But I just had so much pressure in myself that I had, this had to be successful. If it wasn't, then, you know, that was, I was in my thirties, you know, all this stuff was kind of coming up. My last album had lots of success on Spotify. So this had to as well, you know, of course, absolutely. Brand new ones every day. I think um, one thing I've learned is that if you aren't seeing new problems, it's time for you to replace yourself with someone else and <laughs> do something new because there should be new problems all the time. Yeah. It becomes it almost becomes part of the day to day. And you have to just start to be relaxed, actually, because otherwise you will be stressed constantly because yeah. there will be new problems as as things keep getting more and more successful. You come across new problems that you might never have realized would be a problem or could be a problem or even Absolutely. Existed. But I think what you said is really key because what helps with all of that, what helps you become more relaxed is coming from a place of joy mm, and love completely. and compassion completely. rather than fear, which is not easy and it's not a linear route. You're not going to just wake up one morning and decide to do that. Absolutely but not. That's helped me a lot over the last few years of my life of thinking, how, where am I coming from here when I'm making this decision, where I'm making this judgment on myself, when I'm, you know, whatever, spending lots of time on something is it coming from fear or is it coming from joy? And it's literally as simple as that because it really is when you drill down. Yeah, completely. It's like, it's, I think, so I had great, like, counselling a few years ago. My counsellor always put it down to this sort of analogy, which unfortunately we all can probably relate to because this is something that women struggle with a lot. It's like if you had a friend who wanted to lose weight and they were looking in the mirror and they were saying, oh, I look gross, I feel gross, you would never say you know you never say to them yeah you do you need to go to the gym you know you look disgusting but we say those things to ourselves yeah and that's that's 
we're pushing from a place of oh this is this is a negative place to push from when actually if it, if you were supporting someone else going through those things you'd be like okay actually you know just take it day by day you look great now but if you want to feel like healthier you want to work on yourself in that way then it it takes time and you can you can do this but it's just about taking time being easy going easy on yourself and don't make it like they say a ball and chain so we just talk to ourselves sometimes in that really negative way rather than talking to ourselves in the way we probably speak to other people with that compassion and it's trying to change that inner voice yeah and I mean and we are going off a little bit of a tangent here but just something you said I thought was really important to pick up on too is that like I, I've gone on a real journey with how I think about my weight and my body and my appearance. The whole of my life, I felt too big in my body. Even when I look back at photos of me and I objectively now at 37, look at the 26 year old and I'm like, Jesus, hell, you were gorgeous. Yeah. Like, what the fuck were you worried about? <laughs> yeah. You know? I oh did that God. a lot. As well. <laughs> yeah. I was doing, I was like, why am I doing this to myself? Yeah. I'm like what oh. the hell? Mm. And, but I started to really, you know, learn more about fat phobia and diet culture and all that kind of stuff. And what it made me realize was that it wasn't just about me not being horrible to myself. You know, it wasn't just about me not saying, oh, Isabel, you're too fat. Oh, Isabel, you're disgustingly large. Oh, look at your massive broad shoulders, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't just me not saying that. It was me questioning whether that was even a problem in the first place. Yeah. You know, because mm -hmm. the, the thing about me learning a lot more about fat phobia and diet culture is that fat doesn't mean unhealthy. You know, health at every size is a massive movement now, you know. So it's like questioning, no, this is all based on really shallow, really patriarchal ideals of thinness and shrinking women's bodies. So they take up less space and they're more defenseless and they're easier to control basically and make money out of. This is not about whether you're happy or successful or healthy. And so that was, that's very recently for me. I'm 37 and it's only the last year that I've really been getting my head into this. And, and that was really helpful to think it's not just about being kinder to yourself. It's also challenging completely why you would be being mean to yourself in the first place. To be fair, it was something that I struggled with and my, my artists have struggled with it really heavily. And that was, that was so heartbreaking when you see really young, beautiful people, even from society standards, really struggling with it. And sometimes I had to take myself out of those situations as well because it actually impacted me sometimes and I actually have to think right sometimes I just need to remove myself from this because it's going to going to start impacting me even though I am doing the work that I need to do to be able to to deal with this but it doesn't mean that it can't creep back in because it is such a it is such a problem within society as a whole so you know it does it does come into my work so much as well as an artist manager because it's never ending I always think oh maybe the next generation it's gonna it's gonna be different and then I get younger and younger artists and I'm like oh gosh they're gonna need the support too <laughs> so this is not this hasn't gone anywhere yet unfortunately I know it, it is amazing isn't it because I think when you do when you're a bit older it's e it can be easy to think that things have got better because as you get older most people as they get older they do get a bit more assertive a bit more confident but when you do work with some younger women like like for me, when I've been um, lecturing in higher education, like say people on the music degrees at ICMP or BIM, and some of those uh, women in the group who are like 20, 21, absolutely believe that they've passed it. That's it. They missed their boat. They didn't get signed by 21. And that's their career, you know, unless they really, really pull something out of the bag, that's them done. That's and so I've scary been, that it's still yeah. there. It's still so there. And, and I was thinking, wow, I mean, I wasn't at an in industry college when I was doing my degree. I was at much more of a kind of experimental college. But I, I, my cutter point was 25. <laughs> it wasn't 21. Well, yeah, I think I think I guess with like TikTok culture and people doing so well, so young, that might play into play into that because you can you can do well at any age. Like these youngsters on, on YouTube are making absolute fortunes of just from opening presents and things so I do I do understand where they're getting it from but at the same time like we need to redefine like what success is what it means for people to understand that being signed isn't the be all and end all actually that's an, a new risk and a new ball and chain you could potentially be entering into it might work for you but actually it doesn't work for the majority of people who are who are there so um for me I really like to try and do that early on actually is redefine what a successful music career looks like to a person as much as I can and it's hard it's actually a long process it's it's because you can't just spring that on people because 
you're challenging their whole ideals of what the world is and then you put them into this existential crisis so um, that's it's a tough that's a tough part of the job um, but it's one of the reasons why you know with management we don't like to enter into too much of a short-term situation with people because actually it can take a while to get people round to that scenario and then work on their long-term business plan um yeah. so you know if you can't do it over the course of even a year it does have to be like a couple of years until you get them to turn around to that point most of the time so you know some people grasp it quite quickly but even then it's usually after you've been working together for quite some time so and then they'll have this like quick realization but it's not it's really not a quick a quick turnaround and I think a lot of musicians like by the time they do get into their 30s like I'm hearing everything that you're saying. And like when I when I was in my 30s, that's exactly where I'd got, you know. So if I started working with a manager in my 30s I'd be, and you were saying what you're saying, I'm like, yes, I don't care how many Instagram followers I have. I care that I can pay the bills and I care that I can keep doing what I'm doing. You know, whereas when you're 21, that just doesn't make that doesn't mean the same thing, you know, because you don't know you haven't gone through a decade yet of what it means to not have any any backup, you know, any savings, any guarantee you can pay for food the next week. You know, like, well, n- not all, I should say, not some 21-year-olds do know what that yeah, means. Yeah. Mm. And obviously, um, it's really important to acknowledge that. Some eight-year-olds know what that means. But, but many, many people will not know that in the same way you know, and, and not have experienced that. You know, by the time you get to your 30s, most people are like, no, actually, just give me some security. Yeah, completely. Give me, give me a music career that's like I can actually just, you know, nurture my 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 music and do it over the long term. I don't care about having a million TikTok TikTok followers. Yeah, yeah you know. completely, completely. And it's um, it is you know, that's why I do try to introduce it to people as early as I can because once they get there, I generally find that they become so much more business savvy, and it's actually really important for for us that people understand their own business because the reality is one you might want to take that business elsewhere and you need to understand how it works you don't have to work with the same people same manager forever but also so it might happen to me and then what are you going to do if if you're relying entirely on me to run your business so you need to understand how you can delegate that because the reality is an artist or you know songwriter or producer coming to a manager is actually you delegating an element of your your work to someone else um, and I also have to be able to teach it to, to younger artist managers as well. Um, and that's something that's really key for me, actually, because I spent so long floundering in the dark with no one giving us any guidance and really vague answers to questions that we'd ask. When I want specifics, I need to know specifics. I can't work with, oh, you know, just just keep trying, like, you know, all these vague sort of. Yeah, that's that is something that I'm doing. But I need to know specifics, like what should we be investing in at what stages? Like when should I be doing PR versus when I shouldn't be doing PR? Like how big of an audience does it make sense for? Like with what product, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you don't really get those answers. And I think you sort of realize that a lot of people just got lucky with their first artists um, and then just kind of were doing the same thing, like learning off the learning off the back of it. But there are some things that actually are quite, you know, I suppose set and, and they, they apply to marketing and they apply to marketing of anything, not just of music. So um, it would have been nice to have some firm answers. So that's why I try to give people that I do mentor when when they do come to to us for that kind of guidance. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Well, maybe we can just kind of then think about what what was going on for you as a manager in music that made you think I need to set up something like Cactus City. What were you seeing that was saying I I need to set up a new space? Of course. So recording studio really is one of the very first spaces that artists enter into in their career. And it was mostly female clients that were having problems with, you know, people saying, do you want to come work? And then it would turn into a, just a guise for trying to date them. People holding back music, which I still hear of now. People come to stories, come to me with stories of, if you don't date me, I'm going to hold back your music. People getting into relationships with the people that they were working with and then them again, holding back the music people actually being intimidated by the the space and then being told to change how they are so to be sexier in the way that they sing be sort of given unsolicited advice yeah and then they then change what they did and they were unhappy with the end product so actually they spent this money on the studio time and then they were unhappy with the end product so 
it just became apparent that we just needed our own space because this was such a barrier and it was happening so often. People were spending so much money sometimes and it's just so disheartening for people to be sort of treated like that and to not be taken seriously as a business person because obviously at that point, nobody really cares about their their bottom line. It's just, you know, the bottom line goes out the window because you looked at as as an object in itself. It's like, okay, I can't get, I'm not going to get money, but I might get, you know, this yeah. this woman out of this situation. So it just became really apparent we needed our own space so we could just not have to deal with these problems anymore because at one point I was like, okay, let's go in, let's make sure we pay full whack and it's going to get rid of these problems and it didn't always do that. Don't get me wrong, there's obviously people we've worked with and it's been absolutely fine, but so often it wasn't the case. Can you break down that kind of model of how the how money or exchanging money works? Because you're saying, you know, sometimes there's not money exchanging hands in the mm-hmm. studio or you were kind of thinking, right, let's pay full whack. But what were you doing before? So sometimes if people were looking at collaborating on actually producing, songwriting, you wouldn't either always be paying for the studio time or you would be just paying for the recording time, if that makes sense, or the engineering so it'd be under that guise of let's make a song together as like a collaborative project that, that was often the, becoming the problem so then I thought okay if we take at least with the offer to always pay for the session it can try and take back that power dynamic and that was really my mindset I was like make sure you pay for the session one because you want to make sure that you own the masters and the stems and and these things and you have control over the session but two it gives you some personal that power it takes that back that really was my my intention with that that kind of like mindsets like we need to try and find a way to take control over this situation as best as we can I think it's really good that you kind of break that down because I know there'll be listeners who have experienced one or many kind of types of that spectrum because it is like a spectrum you know you have where you pay full whack for every single hour of that person's time Mm -hmm. and you own the masters and you own the stems and that means that you know you have the master rights etc etc but then you have all the other end of the spectrum where you've paid for nothing and like you say you know then you're in a very vulnerable position Mm -hmm. depending on who you're working with but it could be in the middle where you're paying for half of the time Mm -hmm. and the other half of the time is like a favor because they're getting some credits or yeah, they're co-writing it or something like that. And, and the idea is that they will see that return back in the future if the song does well. And that's just the gamble you always take with music. And, you know, so it's good to kind of break that down for people, I think, because like you were saying, people like as from a manager perspective, a lot of musicians that you're not taught that Mm -hmm. you just kind of you get approached maybe by a product producer friend or maybe you approach a studio and they, you know, they tell you, right, we'll do this, this and this. And you don't know that there's actually all these different options and that these different options and choices will then mean potentially different compromises and that there's other ways you can do it as well and unfortunately those compromises are what leads to those pitfalls of well we'll hold this back because we can and I think it is important just to know from a business perspective because you need to know what what it is you're creating how much control you're going to have over the end product as well um, is really important so that is what led us to to start it and I think it's really interesting because we work with a lot of um, male producers, cis male producers straight. And at first, some of them didn't understand why we were creating such a sort of, I suppose, f- feminine space. I Googled heavily as well, by the way, to try to find some inspiration. And there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. Like, I really wanted something that was really, you know, super girly for want of a better word and there's nothing I thought that's really strange like, it's always industrial it's always really sort of if you're lucky you get some wood yeah exactly exactly which, which is great <laughs> you know and may, maybe one plastic plant yeah. and a lamp but that's about it <laughs> but often and you know there's often and don't get me wrong for practical reasons it's great to have a black leather sofa but it was just always such a casting couch feeling we heard some awful stories about people's black leather sofas actually so in studios and that was sometimes the first thing that people would say to us even at some of the biggest studios you you went to so these were just really horrible scenarios you're really setting yourself up with that that vibe when you go into a space where you're actually meant to be creatively free and you want to feel free to to create so one of my long-term collaborative you know, partners, Wolf, he works in a lot of our sound. He said that he didn't realize that when he was inviting people to work with him and they were sometimes coming to his home studio, that he was having this sort of half hour, almost like a dance 
where people were trying to figure him out to see if he was actually being genuine and if the reasons that they'd invited, he'd asked them to come work on stuff was for, you know, genuine reasons and whether it was to make music or not. And then it took them a while to actually get into the flow of a session. Whereas once he was working out of Cactus City, people would come to the space, realize the space was designed for them, be able to get straight into the session. We used to have slippers that people could have, kick the shoes off, get a pair of slippers, get wrapped up in one of the many blankets that would be around. And they'd just be able to just start writing because they'd be like, oh, this is this is a space that's been made for me and I've been thought of. So we can now just get straight into to working. And he didn't realize that that was a problem until he saw the result of doing something different. Yeah, completely. It, it just the, that tension, that that fear had people didn't have it anymore. He's like, oh, we're actually just able to to do the job and actually work and get straight down to actually creating music. And you know, we worked with a, a lot of singer songwriters actually in the first year and worked on projects specifically to to drive income for them. So we worked on a lot of sync projects, we worked to a brief a lot, and that's generally what he'd he'd have the session for it's like okay and they'd be quite short sessions actually because he's very good like, it's like okay this is the session these are the vocals we need to lay down whether you need to go away and take it away and come back we'll do that if you need to um if you need to write more at home or whether they get it done in sort of three to six hours and then when it came to mixing it's like okay don't need you anymore you can you can leave if you want to and i'll, I'll mix the the song and he was able to just go through it because he's quite a specific person and I think a lot of people who work in production are because it's very te- like it's very technical and there's a lot of specifics that you have to work around even though it's, it's it's very creative at the same time and I think it just just changed his viewpoint on things and I think a lot of people cause the, the first studio was in a, a warehouse building with lots of different studios and it it changed a lot of people's minds on on things I think within that space that's interesting so what kind of conversations were you having with the other people in that shared studio space? One, that the, the space was very clean. They're like, oh, this, this is the cleanest studio I've ever been in. <laughs> <laughs> that was an oh often God. came up. Two, um, just that the amount of people that would come in and they'd be working with other producers and they'd always want to come work with us like on, on projects that would love to use this space. Even if it wasn't technically as good as some of the other spaces, don't get me wrong, there's some phenomenal studios in that first building. But it inspire them they'd actually feel like this is a such a relaxed space but like a living room so you could come in and actually feel like I'm just in a space that's it could just be someone's living room so and how just so we can paint the picture of why that was how did it look what how did you make that the case so we made all our own acoustic treatment and they were like a kind of like the Cactus City pink, maybe a little bit more salmon in. And they were like satin on the outside. So they were really, it was really Hollywood, like glamour. There was lots of gold things around. There were a lot of plants. There were a lot of cactuses in the room. A nice, like, textured wool rug, uh, pink sofa, bean bags, um, which aren't always helpful if you're going to sit and record on one. But <laughs> 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 but they were great for me when we had a long, set, late session and I had to sit in the corner and just like, almost be asleep books pictures of amazingly brilliant women in the music industry would be around as well all over the place so it was just it was quite eclectic but it just felt like it felt like a living room it felt you know cozy we had warm lighting rather than having like cold colored lighting that was really key for me actually because I think those lights that are sort of too blue just don't they're not a nice it's not a nice feeling you want to feel like nurtured I suppose in a space like where you're creating and being vulnerable and that was one thing that really came out of it actually when men used the space they were felt that they were able to be more vulnerable with the music that they made which was nice it's interesting yeah that's really interesting because I think I think something that is really important is to think it's for us to think about how changing up these spaces or just providing alternative one types of spaces whether that's online or in you know in person in bricks and mortar that no matter what gender you are, that could really enhance what you do. And there'll be so many cis men out there who are probably hearing the description of your studio there, or that I know it's the first one that you had, and thinking, yeah, I actually really prefer to record in that studio. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. And that's it. You can't, like I say, we try not to gender things, but it's just, it's just a way to describe things, I think. But it did... It is that 
element of I don't need to actually put on this bravado I don't need to put on this front I can talk about my feelings potentially when people didn't think that I would or should be in the the type of music that they might make and you know that comes through in lots of different genres I think where people feel that they have to be in a certain space to be able to to get an audience and people won't be able to relate to them but actually they, people probably will relate to you if you are being more vulnerable and that is some of the best music that people can make and that's often one of the bits of feedback that I give to us when they send me music I'm like, I can't you know I don't need to know to to live the same life as you but sometimes I need to feel a bit more like I think the mm. feeling and that vulnerability in music yeah. sometimes so that other people can relate to it is really important mm. it changed my viewpoint on a lot of things because it wasn't again it wasn't we didn't intend it for many that were like right, well, this is for the girls because we're going to come here we're going to have our own space and then it was a friend well now my business partner actually he reached out to me to speak about mindfulness that's how we, we met and they'd had a difficult time in in music that gone to a studio the producer had lost all their work they spent three thousand pounds on it and then they had to restart and they were just really financially struggling at the time they were all in uni and I was like I'll come to the space we'll give you a discount and it was like oh we've got all these like rappers rolling through like and they're all like six foot something and they're like this this wasn't what we thought was going to be the case but whatever and they ended up really liking it ended up being their favorite space that they've ever used and still is now so it really opened my mind to things because I wasn't even thinking like that because all my clients were women actually at the time. So I wasn't even thinking about it from a from a man's perspective. But I think, you know, it's really important for us as an organization not to get lost in a conversation that's an echo chamber. We need to be reaching people that actually we need to reach. Otherwise, there's no point for us, actually. We know the problems as women that we face in the music industry. What we need is for other people to understand those problems. And if we can't speak to, to other people who potentially might not even realize they are part of the problem sometimes, because most people actually aren't malicious. Most people aren't doing things that they realize is a as an issue. I think, you know, I've visited so many studios where I was the only woman in the group of um, the team and people don't say hello to me and they don't say goodbye to me either. Um, and I was like, this is, they might not know that this is a problem because they're not thinking about it. And on spe we're speaking to men. Some men, it's, they think it's because they don't want to offend someone if that's someone's girlfriend, which is still a problem because that's a toxic yeah, masculinity it's still problem. Sexist. Yeah, yeah, it's still a problem. But that's still presuming someone's there just completely to, to, chill, to, hack, to kill some time rather yeah. than actually do their job. Completely. And yeah. it's, and even if they are, like, it, yeah. it, they're still a human being. And that's the yeah. problem that they think, oh, well, potentially someone's going to act out um, violently. It's like, that's a toxic, mas that's a masculine, that's a male problem. Yes. Like, this, is, yeah. this, this problem is you're scared of other men as well, like, actually. Yeah. So yeah. Th the problem is, you know, it's a societal problem. It's not just within music. But I think that within music, there are just so many power dynamics at play that give individuals so much perceived power that we have so much to, to take down and to, to get into. So we can't, we just can't have the conversation on our own. We need to make sure that other people understand the problem. Yeah, I really agree with that. And I think that's been something that I've, I've found really um, encouraging about doing this podcast is that I have had, you know, men get in touch with me saying, I love this podcast because it's so refreshing to hear people not just like, not just learn about women's experience in music and music technology, but also um, have conversations about music technology that are a bit more vulnerable, that are a bit more person centered, that are focusing on, you know, this kind of psychological experience or or even the creative process of using technology rather than just. And I know this is reductive and this is not every other music technology podcast, but, you know, just reviewing a bunch of gear, mm -hmm. or, <laughs> uh, you know, like in, impressing with how many different uh, synthesizers you work yeah like, completely <laughs> completely completely um, and I think yeah. it's, it's a very can be a very lonely job at times um, I had an interesting conversation in a masterclass I was doing the other day with a quite a young engineer sort of getting his first steps into the business and he was asking how he could make his space feel more welcoming and more safe to 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 artists and I said sometimes it's just a case of having a conversation at the start of a session because you're going to turn around and they're going to see the back of your head for so much of this time. And then you just become like this, especially if you're early into the stages of your career, you're almost like an enigma doing something that looks magic to people who, who are sitting behind you and might not have those skills. Or maybe you can even open it up and say, do you want to learn some of this? And that can, that can actually start a conversation and actually involve people in the process because it is a very lonely process. And again, you spend so much time looking at screens, so much time 
in because you feel like you're almost inside your um DAW sometimes you actually feel like you're in it um to make it work and when I'm like looking at music so I don't spend much time mixing that's not my role really but when I am involved in it I, I can see where things are sitting and I actually look at this you know I look at almost look at the screen but also between the monitors and I'm like okay the, the vocals sitting on top of where they need to sit you see it visually so you know involve people in that process sometimes potentially it doesn't have to be for a long time it can sometimes you know not be useful but just sort of humanizing that experience is important so that that does make a lot of sense what you've said that that feedback would would be something that's there Mm -hmm. yeah so after that space I take it you then found your own space so we are building our own space at the minute so that's what we're doing at the moment that's a long process a lot longer than I realized it was going to be and a lot more expensive than we might have thought it was ever going to be when I got the square foot quote for how much to build a industrial standard recording studio I was very shocked but thankfully my business partner's dad is a he actually builds like cinemas recording studios hotels etc so we had a really good handle on that side of things. So that's currently what we're doing now. But we are we're sort of in between two sites. So it's not not fully committed. And unfortunately, it actually could be a very, very, very long term project now. But I've realized yeah. Um, yeah. because we have to involve we have to involve councils because the reality is we're bringing something into spaces that's new. It's it brings in culture, it brings in diversity. So it's actually helpful to to them to have it there. Um, so it's actually been a big, much bigger project than we ever thought it would be. But we still have our own sort of smaller spaces that are, I suppose, our own. Because we still have to work on music. So we do have smaller spaces, but they're not the commercial space yet. And are they, so are they dotted around in different kind of shared studio spaces? Or is it the same space that you were describing before? So no, we, did, we didn't go back to the original space. I really liked the original space, but the problem was it wasn't, it didn't have good transport links. And that was actually really, really um that was a big problem for us. So we have one up north, actually, um, but that's built out of someone's um, garage. So it's not, again, it's not a commercial space, but it's just the producers that we work with work in there. And then we have one um, in Surrey as well. Great. Okay. Wonderful. So I know that, though, what you do at Cactus City is more than recording music. Mm-hmm. Can you explain what are the other facets of your work? So um, I suppose the main facet that we are at the minute is we are mostly the work we're doing at the minute is activism activism actually in terms of getting other organizations to change so we've implemented a charter of good practice which recording studios have signed up to to take on our ethos so we realized that what we were doing because other people wanted to use the space it wasn't intended as a commercial venture we couldn't take all those we can't take all those people on actually because we don't have the time we didn't have the we didn't have the slots so and we also can't be everywhere at once. So we thought, how can we be everywhere at once? Well, we can actually create our ethos and say to other spaces, look, if you sign up to this, this chart of good practice, this ethos, actually, it's going to impact your bottom line because people know that you're going to adhere to, you know, being better or not even being better. Or it's just thinking about their best practice. They actually care about it. And you can say that we care about it, even if it was things they were doing before. Just being able to commit to it is is something. So that became our main focus last year. And it's still actually one of our main focuses, looking at getting studios to sign up to the charter. At the moment, what we're working on is actually getting the studios onto the the site so people are able to book via us if they want to. So they'll be able to book sessions via us and they're able to then obviously give feedback if they want to. And we welcome positive feedback as well. Like It's not just for people to say, well, we've had a negative experience. We actually want to hear that people are doing a good job and what what that sounds like and what that looks like. So we're able to recommend spaces to people and actually be able to do that from a genuine perspective, it's really important for us that we're actually giving genuine recommendations. We're not sending people to places where we think um, potential detriment could come to them. So our work at the moment is that's our main thing. And then we're looking at um, doing some sync projects this year and actually bringing people in to learn how to create dynamic music, different versions of music, trailer music, because it's something that they can get paid in quite early. And actually a lot of publishers are looking for my, more diverse rosters. They actually have such male heavy production rosters that they've actually approached us and said look will you be able, you're able to help us with this so that's one thing that we're working on as well this year um and then we we have events now um, which we always make sure artists get paid that's really key for us 
um, yeah. make sure that everyone who's working at the event gets paid. So the first event that we had in November, we actually ended up hiring some people who came to the event because they said, how can we volunteer? for you we really want to work here like could we be a volunteer I was like well no you can't because we don't have any volunteers everyone who works here gets paid because that's the whole point of what we're doing we want people to actually have mm. careers in music to understand that actually that economic so we talk about this a lot um and we spoke about it in on our in our international women's day speech about the economic factor and the economic threat of not having an income or being blacklisted is actually where the power dynamics lie and that that problem is then something that everyone can face. It's not just something that women face. It's something that if you threaten people with a loss of income, they're going to be complicit in things that potentially shouldn't happen. And because there's all these perceived individual power dynamics within the music industry, people are really scared of that. They're really scared of, oh, I'm not going to work again. I'm not going to be able to, to do this. And as we know from the stats, the majority of people in the music industry aren't getting paid. They're just working for free. They're just working, hoping they'll make a living. Um, and off the back of the pandemic, it's, it's gotten worse. So it's it's an industry where people are pretending they're actually getting paid when they're not because they don't want to seem like things are doing badly. So there's smoke and mirrors at every level. So that's another thing that we do. We want to dispel the myths and the economics because actually that's, that's really key for us. I think getting paid, people deserve to be paid. It's important. It's important for their lives. It's important for their, their value and their self-worth. Um, but also it's, we, we can't let that that um that go on we can't have this culture of people working for so long for free for experience etc don't get me wrong you have to work hard you really do have to work hard and it's a competitive industry and it's not going to change but it doesn't mean that you should be exploited within that space either yeah yeah absolutely i know i think um i agree and i think that as well as that economic threat there's there's like a if your if your economics your personal economics or finances are not healthy you are not healthy you know and it's so so hard to keep going not just in music but also you know it can be on a physical level it can be on a mental level it can be in your relationships whatever if it's really important to value your financial health Completely. which is not the same as being greedy as being you know exploitative it means valuing your your existence as a human and the time and the energy you put in and the skills that you bring. Completely. Like we're really, we're really key on we're always telling our team, don't need to message us at eight o'clock at night and on the weekend, because the social team don't work on a weekend. So if anything crops up, we had a comp we got given some free tickets to a show the other day and we had to run a competition on the weekend. And I was like, Sally, we've got to do it ourselves. Because we can't ask the team to do it. We don't make them wait work on weekends. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And we're really keen on, you know, take your time, like have your work-life balance. We de we're just running social media, you know, when it comes to that that team. We don't need you all the time. You, know, you don't have to be here. There's no we're, we're, there's no huge emergency that we'll probably be facing. And if there's any sort of, you know, reputational emergency that we might be facing, me and Sally are going to deal with that anyway because it's our responsibility, uh, you know, as, as execs and at the top. So it is really important for us to, to establish that. And even when I've been looking at contracts and things when, you know, sometimes – lawyers might send back key people clauses to me and I'm like ah oh, but this doesn't take into account if someone has parental leave and now we've got to have this really awkward conversation of like if someone's gone from a team for 30 days the, the artist might leave and I'm like oh but what if someone has a baby so like we, we, we can't I can't guarantee that they're they're, they're management we, we have a management company as well and it's not just me there's, there's other, other managers I'm like if you put that person's name down and they have a child and then you leave because of that even though there's someone who's capable of doing their job, that's, that, you know, it's, there's all these things to think about. And I think that plays into ageism, it plays into sexism, like people haven't always traditionally thought about these things, whereas we really do think about these things. These are really important things to us. Um, or if they say cumulatively, you're not there for 30 days, I'm like, well, that's, that's all the weekends of the year, like, and less. Like, it was like, well, the teams don't work on Sundays because they not have 52 Sundays off a year like I can't I can't guarantee these things sometimes so it's just really interesting conversations that I've been having recently around that and around the balance in the music industry I think I mean Sally talks about it a lot more because she's she's a parent so she's had those experiences of I can't do these late nights sometimes I can't I, I just can't like the, the the support isn't isn't there it's not in place the flexibility isn't there and it's just you know, it's just not facilitated. It's not even thought to be facilitated because there's so many people who want to be here that are in situations where they don't have to think about the kids. They don't have to think about these things that they go, I'll just get someone else. 
Yeah. And and I think when you kind of wind the clock back maybe 30, 40, 50 years, when the music industry was really in its heyday, well, the people that were really involved in the industry were older men who had a wife at home who did all the, the domestic stuff for them. And it meant that they could be out at all hours doing whatever they wanted and there'd be people taking care of their kids or whatever else behind the scenes. And then basically teenagers who were the musicians. That was it. You know. So they could all be out at all hours, do whatever yeah. they wanted to, and no one had to think. No one had to think about it. So it was. Yeah. It's. It's. It's just really interesting. Like, there are really interesting conversations that I'm having around these things at the minute because, for us, we have to really live our ethos. You know, we're trying to ask people to to put in better work life balances, making sure people get paid. So we have to do it all the time. Otherwise, we just won't do things. And and can I ask, like, as one business owner to another, how is your work life balance? Because mine. You you can kind of you can feel that responsibility for other people, but you know I know that I go through phases where I I'm just like God my brain is constantly fried because I'm constantly on my phone and I'm constantly on my laptop and I just don't feel like there's even an hour in any day whether it's the weekend or not where I can't be on call you know completely and even on call <laughs> is like me being curious about oh, I wonder if anyone's commented on that post. And I'll be like, Jesus Christ, Isabel, but because it's your baby, you're just in it all the time. Completely, completely. I think. I mean, I think, I think, I think having a team has at least removed me from that side of things. Like I'll, I, I don't, I mean, I have a set way the voice of the company has to be and things that we say and things that we don't say. But I've semi removed myself from social and, and the engagement with the world, at least in some way, because I'm so I'm behind the scenes now a lot more and actually looking at um, the way the industry is working, not so much the way that, that it's, it's engaging with the world. However, my work by balance has been a struggle. Definitely. I think November 2020, when we set this up, I remember um, when we set the organization up as an actual community interest company, I remember the nights, me and my business partner, Yinka, who I live with, we were up till 2, 3, 4 a.m., probably for about two, three weeks in a row doing things because we were looking at grants because there's all these COVID recovery grants. We're like, okay, let's be as resourceful as we can. We'll make the most out of this. We can pay some salaries out of this. We had all these these, these plans, but that, in, that involved doing a lot of, of legwork, a lot of admin and a lot of research into things that we'd never done before. We'd never done pensions we'd never done paye we'd never done any of this stuff so we ha- we had to to look into it and we had to adhere to certain timelines i was looking at um investment so i was looking at how um sitr worked which was uh it's the social investment um tax relief scheme which is like seis which is for sort of more corporate entities so sitr is for like charities and community interest companies to raise funds and it was the case that there was a sunset clause on this this social side of things that was coming into place. I was like, if we don't do it now, we're going to run out of time. So then we're going to have to do this, deal with this accountancy in this very small space of two weeks, do all this fundraising. There was just so much to look into, so much to, to do. that I was like, we haven't actually got any time for ourselves. And that was really difficult. And then for the first sort of six months, I'd say, yeah, I think it was April to October, I was then managing all our staff. So we had Sally. So she was my business partner, or she is my business partner in Cactus City, but she still had a full-time corporate job at that time. So I was managing her marketing team and she was just kind of dictating to me how that worked. So I had absolutely no work-life balance because I was still having to do all the behind the scenes. Um, she came on board in October. And then again, it was still the case. I still had so much to do. I've got Sally now. She can help manage the group, but I've still got so much to do. And it was the beginning of this year that I said, I can't live like this actually and I spoke to um my PA so I'd got a PA at this point and I said to her that and my cleaner had quit and she'd literally held my sanity in her hands my cleaner because she used to come every morning every Monday she was great with the dogs um mm. she'd just get it done in three hours and then she because we were working from home it feel like the, the house was refreshed for the week ahead so it was it was a real real hold on my sanity that I don't think she realized That's, what she had. that is what I need that's <laughs> yeah. what I need because it's just bonkers like I've worked from mm-hmm. home why it just feels ridiculous mm-hmm. that I would need a cleaner, but I need a cleaner. Yeah, completely. Like, you're buying your own time back. That's what that's what you're doing, unfortunately. And you know, my cleaner's really well paid. Like I wouldn't think, oh, you know, this is so I can make more money. No, it's so I can 
I can't, I don't have the time to do this. I'd love to do it. I actually really enjoy cleaning, in fact. Yeah, me just too. just don't yeah. have the time to do it because a Monday morning especially is a really important time for me. But at the same time, I need to feel like I'm in a clear environment to get Monday mornings cracking the way they need to go. So, um, yeah, so I'd lost my cleaner. I'm like, this is just terrible. And I just spoke to my PA and I said, you know what we need to do? We need to work in a different way. I can't squeeze in time for myself as the last resort. I need to put that in as the first thing. Otherwise, I'm going to keep struggling with burnout. I'm not going to, I'm going to feel stressed. And at the minute, I don't feel stressed. And I actually have so much to do. And I think it's because yesterday I took, even though I've been all over the place this week, we've had multiple events, I've been in Manchester, come back down yesterday, I had a UN women this week to chat to their safe spaces round table. We've had that many events, I can't even remember what's actually happened this week. It's been so hectic. And you, and I've had payroll to run yesterday for the last time. And that's always, that usually stresses me out a bit. And I was like, it's been so hectic this week, I thought I'd be really stressed. And then I booked in some spa time yesterday. And I usually do that after feeling stressed. I thought, no, I'm going to do it ahead of feeling stressed so that I don't have, I'm not going for recovery. I'm going because I want to be there. So I do that now, like once a month, like I'll book in like a little treat for myself. So at least I've got that there. And rather than going as recovery, so I've been like, you know, three months of work too hard. I need to go make myself feel a bit better. I do it because it's something that's nice that I've got myself. And then I started booking ballet in as my first first thing. So I'm a really creative person, but I don't get time for creative. And that, that was making me sad for a while. So I thought, how can I do something that's creative? I don't have to, it doesn't have to be something that I carry on. So, you know, if you work your music, it's usually something that you have to keep going with and carry on and finish. Otherwise you've just, you know, you've had a session and it feels wasted. Whereas if you go to a ballet class, you don't need to take that class and do something additionally to make it make sense. You can just go be creative get that that necessary respite and that necessary it feeds my creative side and it then it you know it gives me that even though I don't have it from work all the time because I am doing so much stuff that I say that 95% of the time when I'm not doing stuff I don't like doing I still feel like I want to be creative but I know that I can't always do that I don't have those hours so how can I treat myself well enough in the time I do have yeah yeah I think that's really good advice to everyone listening because I know there'll be people listening. They're like, Isabel, I don't have the money to to do a spa day once a month or whatever. I don't even have the money to do a ballet class. But what people can do, though, you know, is is make sure that they timetable in some self-care. And that might be a walk. That might be a bath. That might be just some time on their own, not doing anything, you know, for 20 minutes in the morning, sitting in a garden or in their bedroom or whatever. but just and actually, you know, sometimes it's literally like getting a slightly nicer moisturizer than yeah, you normally would. Yeah, that's it. That's completely it. Like you say, and, that, and that having a nice so key sometimes. Yeah. So and sometimes yeah, just taking know. my dog for a walk um, more often in the day than I usually would. That's actually a big one for me. And another thing that I've been doing lately is rather because sometimes I, you know, use it as a crutch. I'd reach for a bottle of bottle of wine in the evening and have a glass because I'm like, okay, oh, that's a stress relief. The stress is gone that one glass of wine then sometimes that one glass of wine can turn into a bottle of wine so what I've been doing is just finding a fragrance like an essential oil like that I like and using just just a scent actually to just try and relax it's so powerful and it's one of the things that like I mean I I don't go to I'm like you and that if I go to a spa I will relax and so I I I don't go to the spa a lot I don't have one near me and I don't have a car so it's kind of you know and and I and I yeah, I can't afford to go all the time, but I got a really good deal on a spa holiday for me and my boyfriend for our anniversary. We went away for three nights and we spent two full afternoons just in the swimming pool, sauna, steam room. And the smell is amazing. And and it's a bit like what you're saying, like I booked it months ago just because I was like, well, let's do something nice for our anniversary. I, I, like I say, it was a really good deal as well. I was like, F it, let's just do it. But what the time that it came is has been a really busy time. And it was really good for me because I just got that little respite of, okay, I'm going to stop. And even though I'm having to work weekends around this so that I can go, I am having that time where I am just totally tuning out of all of this. 
But but the reason I'm talking about it as well is because I remember walking into the spa and just immediately getting hit by that smell. And that smell is as relaxing as me taking that first gulp of wine or whatever. You know, and obviously you can have smells and wine, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, depending on <laughs> how you're feeling. But, um, but yeah, like on a day to day basis or week by week basis, there are some really simple things that you can do that will really um, just help you prioritize. And I like what you're saying about you book that in first, you timetable that in first, because otherwise, you know, all the other hours in the day are going to get booked up with other stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's so, really so, important. so quick that that happens. Like my, my, you know, my time now has just become people, my phone never stops actually now. Like I've got, I've, I've, I've had to start turning it off at weekends. I've had no choice but to turn it off at weekends. Otherwise it, it would never, ever, ever stop. And and is that like is that uh, notifications from social media or is that people texting you or messaging you saying how do you do this thing what's going on about that deadline it's it's mostly people actually um like you say like t- asking for help um, and, uh, because um, <laughs> like they're just asking for help and I'm like fair enough I'm probably able to help in some way or at least you know divert people sometimes but I need to stop for myself otherwise like, I'm not able to do that like and that's a big part of my job is actually facilitating like I'm a facilitator that's what that's what you know an artist manager is that's really what we do with the cat city we're trying to facilitate people's careers so my role that is my the core core role that I have despite all these other things that go around it that is my core role so people look to me for that quite a lot and it's, it feels like such a big burden and a big responsibility. And sometimes I need to just be able to step away from that and take responsibility for myself. So, and it is that turn off, that turn off that I get when I'm at the spot. I had to replicate that, as you say, without being there. With, I might have to replicate that at home. So if I am in a bath, make sure my phone's nowhere near me because it's so easy to reach for your phone when you're in the bath. And I just try and leave it away because it's. I think you're always forced to turn off when you go somewhere that, you know, if you go on holiday the first couple of days, it's it can be, okay, I'm still in work mode. And then you're forced to switch off. It just happens. And that switch off is so important. I really like to take Christmas off as well. Like I don't like to, I always make sure I'm not cooking at Christmas because it's like, I'm not cooking at Christmas. I've worked really hard. This isn't, I'm not doing it. Like I'm absolutely not. Yeah. This is my day, these are my days off. These are very rare days off that I get. But I've had to, I've just had to start putting it in as a, as a priority because otherwise, it, and it sometimes it's one of the things where yesterday was meant to be my day off fully but I was like oh but I actually have to do have to make sure the team gets paid because that's actually very important yeah. to make sure people yeah. get paid um I know. So it's one of the things where it's my day off technically but I've got this meeting and I've got this other thing to do so is it really my day off it isn't really so it, I have to have to have to find a way to at least switch off my brain because it, it's just, it would never, it would never stop. But it's, it's just hard. It's, it's hard. I was in the spa yesterday getting massage thinking, why am I thinking about what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about <laughs> the pensions and how they need to get fixed. And it, know, why is this happening? <laughs> why is this happening? <laughs> and then for an no, hour I, I mean... switched off. But then it was just like, why is the, I've still got half an hour of this awful thought. It's just so just terrible yeah no I I totally I can totally relate to all of that and I'll be like I'll be really tired by like nine o'clock in the evening I'll go up to bed I'll get into bed and I'll be you know nodding off to sleep and then I'll start thinking about oh but if I move that podcast episode around to that date then that means that person's got that release and I can move that person up to here you know and you're like why it's just that there's so many moving parts when you're that person that's kind of holding all this stuff together and obviously I now have over 300 students that have gone through my online course for example that's amazing and then which is amazing but you know I will I, I want to you know I, I know that my students will look to me a lot of the time for help and for advice and so um and then there's obviously the podcast and then there's obviously the social media and it, there's just so many layers of like holding everything together and then 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 there's obviously you know reopening the doors for home recording academy and etc etc so and then new kind of new things will come up like um like this season's being sponsored by isotope who make you know really good production software and that's great but then that's like a whole other job of like getting that all sorted out getting the contract ready at the um that i just hadn't predicted yes completely oh completely <laughs> you know, so completely it's when just... we're dealing with american companies and we have to go through the um w8 ben 9 form or whatever it's called i'm just like i have no idea what i'm doing this form and it's like we're just 
we're just trying to get paid, but we can't because until we've filled out these tax forms. So like, yeah. all these things yeah. just don't think is going to happen. It's like, oh yes, we've got this great sponsorship. Oh no, we've got to do some yeah. job raising hoops to get the money. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, and you know, like, I think that when you are the kind of person that sets up a business you enjoy those puzzles, you know, like I enjoy turning them around in my head, but it's then knowing how to switch off because even if you enjoy it, it's like the music thing. It can, it can start to, you know, be in control of you. It can start to own you. And, and, and that's something that I think is, I think musicians struggle with this too, with regards to social media, with regards to just promoting themselves, that it can feel like you never switch off from it. And I think we all have to kind of reckon with that these days, don't we? We do. I I genuinely, if I could, I'd have someone manage my own personal social media because I hate it. And I'm actually really keen on people emailing me because I can't guarantee that I will get back to you on social media. And don't get me wrong, I'm really mindful that actually not everyone has the same ability of using the same platform. So it might be easier for people to send voice notes than it is to, to type and they might not have the software they need to, to convert things around. So I do try to to come around to other people's um, needs, but at the same time, I still have to balance my own. And sometimes I think I'm going to get on top of that stuff and, you know, put out information in regards to them, I most frequently ask questions. Do I need to start making um, content that I can refer people to, actually? Because then it's going to save me some time. Yeah, it's going to be a bit of effort in the first instance. But if people keep coming to me for the same things, I can like, well, you can refer to this. And then if you have any questions off the back of that, hopefully that answers things. But if you have any questions off the back of that, then you can come to me. (laughs) If this in any way makes you feel better for not doing that yet, Vanessa, what I can tell you is when you do that, then you get even more people asking you questions about it. So, I bet, I bet, I bet, I bet. Yeah. I can imagine. I completely can imagine. Which is all good because obviously like I, I've put many things out and I and I want people, that's the whole point of my business is to be educating more women and, you know, but, but, the, but the reality is I'm sure if you put out some information, you would get more, more people coming to you. So Oh, yeah, I think eventually, <laughs> potentially, consultancy will be on the cards, but not just yet. I think, you know, I see a lot of coaches and I think some of the coaches do some brilliant jobs. But I think and people have said to me, oh, you'd be a great coach, but I'm not done what I want to. I'm not achieved what I want to achieve yet. I want to get all the important. way through. I want to get all the way through so I can actually genuinely guide people um, with these difficult, difficult. I'm doing it with Sally now at the minute because this is her first ever, her first ever own business actually like I've done it for years and it's kind of nice because sometimes she'll be struggling with things I think mm, I just need to let her get to yes, get to her own yeah. realization and just having that patience is something that I've had to learn as a as a, a business owner and a business partner thinking she's not there yet and actually her getting there isn't something I can push her into she needs to get there herself because I have to get there myself but she's got you know she's got extra guidance to to come along um but it's just really interesting to to see someone else going through it the same things now it's really 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 interesting like the other day we had an event and I had to take myself away from it because I, I'll get really stressed if I'm in the situation and everyone's asking me questions in the venue I was like I've got my phone on me I'm gonna go get ready outside the venue because I'm just there to, to dictate. But I'm like, if I'm in the space, people are going to be coming to ask me questions they don't need to ask me. And I could actually ask other people. So I try and take myself out of it so that people actually ring me with the important questions. Mm-hmm. And it was about four o'clock or three o'clock. The, no, it's four o'clock. The event was at um, starting at half past six, seven. And even though I'd gone in on Monday and checked with the venue, is this is the drink sponsors sent the, the drinks over they're like yeah 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 but it's stored in our other venue which is around the corner so I wanted to get some to take some content and I was like right fine I could have done with some to take some content in advance but fine we'll I'll, we'll do it on the day came to the day that the actual drink sponsors drinks weren't there it was all the mixers so we only had mixers and no alcoholic beverages which is a problem when you invite people in the music industry down for free cocktails <laughs> yeah. so it's a couple yeah. of hours before it starts Sally's calling me, she's really panicking. I was like, I mean, there's a, there's a solution, Sal. Just speak, just speak to the bar manager. They thought the drinks were there. Just say that we'll just get, I'm like, we'll just buy some alcohol at cost. I'm sure they'll give it to us at cost to go with the mixers. And then it's problem solved. Like, you know, they're problem solved. But to be fair, the company were great. They literally, they taxied around the whole of London and sent, um, drinks if they, they tried to find stock and they sent us 
um, wow. they sent us the drinks and they got there in that's time. Great. It was really, 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 really good of them. But I wasn't stressed about it. I was like, that's not a problem. We're in a bar. We're gonna there's, there's drinks in the bar. Like there's a solution here. Like this, this isn't this isn't a big problem at all. This is something that we can we can fix quite quickly. Um, but it's just those things. It's like when to panic, when not to panic. And now I'm just like, don't really panic at all. Yeah. So I've just dealt with so many things for the first time now that I'd never thought I would deal with that you, you, you just kind of realize that that panic doesn't help actually that worrying doesn't help what helps is going in online and seeing that probably someone's been through the same situation how can we find a solution to this what are the solutions to this what are the you know what are good steps to take definitely yeah uh... Yeah, definitely. And I, I lo- just that little example that you gave is a really good example of kind of be, having the th- having thinking that is open enough that you're not just focused on this one thing that we had planned hasn't mm. happened. Mm. You know, and just being able to immediately in that moment say, well, where else is alcohol in the world? Yeah. Oh, right there at the bar. Yeah. You know, just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, exactly. You know, it's, it's easy to get really focused on, oh no, this thing's gone wrong and it's not how I planned it. And now that that's gone wrong, I'm going to panic because everything else might go wrong or, you know, but being able to, I, I think it's a good lesson for anyone, especially musicians, um, you know, because it could be about a, a launch that you're mm-hmm. doing. It could be about a release. It could be about even just collaborating of like, right, how else can I go work around this? What have I got in front of me? You know, it's like being resourceful. This thing hasn't worked out, but what do I have to hand? How can I get this Completely. off the ground? I think at release as well, it's very, very, very key, actually, that lesson, because so much goes wrong at release. Because you can't guarantee things are going to be received the way you want to. Sometimes even, actually, your ads don't get cleared and you don't know why. You know, if you say if you've got a, a video and you thought it was absolutely fine, you've done all the right things, you've made sure that it's it's clean, you've done this, that, whatever, and then it'll be completely something obscure that you wouldn't have thought about that that stops something from from taking off. So you can you can face these problems and think, I thought I'd prepared for these problems, and I, and I absolutely haven't, and that might mean re-editing a video completely, which we didn't have, yeah. you weren't planned for. But you know, do you waste the product or do you do you, do you do something new? And that's and it feels like it's not smooth, but the reality is you not everything is smooth I think I think release is a really stressful time for a lot of artists I noticed I really really noticed that um because they just it doesn't feel natural to them so you know those are the times we actually have to be very flexible uh, not too flexible that you stop focusing on yeah. it but just flexible enough that you kind of are willing to be open-minded it's um yeah I think it's it's a different way of thinking where rather than getting so attached to the plan it's working towards an end goal and just making whatever making use of whatever you have to get to that end goal Mm -hmm. completely and and that means that you could you have to have some kind of plan to get to the end goal but if that any part of that plan doesn't work out you can just quickly find something else Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes it's not quick you know but you you find another way of getting to that end goal that's the most important thing not that you follow through in the plan not that the plan works not that the plan goes to plan yeah exactly get to the end goal exactly you might not have got the pre-saves you wanted but then you might you know you might end up getting a really good shazam day or something i don't know it could it's yeah. so many different things that could happen you might get played in a really really cool place and like 100 people shazam it in one venue yeah. um and these are the you know these are the things you can't plan for that you've got no idea that that could happen so you know it's you kind of have to to i suppose tick off the even the good things that have happened that aren't aren't in the plan um but it is hard and i think i think i do see artists struggle with that a lot actually that taking that um that release, I think release is a really, really difficult time. So just just not being so hard on yourself then, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I was wondering, actually, just for, on some advice for artists. I know that, you know, you said something you're really passionate about is helping artists to start monetizing their music. Do you have a, a good tip for maybe it's a mindset shift, maybe it's a practical step they can take to start that process of monetizing their music? So I think just in terms of general knowledge, like it might seem really straightforward, but often people don't understand their publishing. They don't understand the, the, the administrative side. They will either just sign up to um, a publisher without signing up to a royalties collection site thinking that it's the same thing. Um, so actually just getting on top of all those sides of things. And I notice that a lot. I notice pe- people have been in music for years and have no idea how to get their royalties collected and 
some of the stories that I've heard recently, you won't believe some of the artists who've lost out on years of their royalties because at, at really big points in their careers because they didn't know that they that they needed an administrator to, to, to actually mm-hmm. deal with them. Um, so it's just it's just speaking to I, I suppose having a chat not always with the manager you don't need a manager actually um because if you're taking 20 percent of not much or nothing you probably don't need a manager yet you need to build a business for someone to come in and help manage at a point where you can't manage anymore but maybe having a chat with a a, a good consultant on actually looking at the different streams because there are so many different streams of revenue and then working on the things that you like first and building that to a good point so whether that be a creator fund whether that be um you know looking at youtube are you good at videos whether that be are you good at creating you know creating beats could you get good at production like actually working on skills that you have and focusing on those because you can't do everything. You'll never be able to do everything. But if you can find that one thing that you are good at and you can monetize that and it doesn't compromise the person that you are as an artist, um, then 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 use that to build a business. You can always shift it to the place you want to be. I think one big thing for me is that a lot of artists and producers are really focused on the, the, the exact thing they want. So they have like this this absolute top of the pyramid goal and rather than putting work into the other things that they can do which they don't see as their ideal goal um but they could bring the money in earlier they really just put all their time and energy into that really high risk often thing rather than saying oh actually you know i could do a bit of songwriting here i could maybe work on some sync projects here you can get an alias actually as a producer um, you don't have to use your name. You can use a, a, a or songwriter. You can use a different name. So you know when you sign up to to a PRS or whatever, you can have three names actually in different CAE numbers. Um, and a lot of people don't know that, and that's why they don't do it. They're like, oh, it's compromising my brand. I don't want to do this kind of music. So, well, actually, if you're really good at that and people want it from you, why not? If you know you don't have to put your brand on it. Um, yeah. And it's just finding those other things that you're good at, and people you know, provide value in some way, shape or form. And you'll just build the support underneath the the, the pyramid that you need for that top goal. Um, and it'll make it easier to get there because once you start monetizing earlier, you have more momentum. So rather than like looking at this really, really like really lofty goal that's far away and really ambitious and can cost a lot of money to, to get to, start looking at the things where you can be in music and be monetizing earlier. I think that's my my main tip. That's my main tip for all my artists as well. Actually, when I when I first start working with them, I'm like, if you want to leave your day job, because a lot of them come to that's a lot a lot of people come to me and say, I want to leave my day job. Fine, but it's unlikely that you're going to do it for this very quickly yeah. in the way Just the world releasing works. Your yeah, first exactly, album. Yeah. completely. Yeah, uh, you know, once the first time I saw a hundred dollars or more come through in a streaming check, I was like, this is amazing. First time I saw a thousand dollars come through in a year, I was like, this is amazing. Like, because it's that it's that yeah. it's that hard to get to those numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it takes a long time and you can't just do it off the back of that. So you just have to think, what actually can I do? And sometimes that means thinking of thinking of product. Can I, you know, have I got, can I sell to peop- my, the people and my fans? Can I actually put on shows? Can I do live? Like, can I, am I capable of, of putting on an event for other artists that, that gives them value? So actually just thinking of the other things that you do have skills in that can to support that but not taking you away from the music industry that you love so much um you know if you hate your retail job then you have to identify the skills you have and the gaps in your skill set to be able to come out of your retail job if you really 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 are like, i hate my job i don't want to be it anymore i want to do this well fine that's you but you have to you have to do it it isn't going to be easy but you do have to reflect on yourself think what do I need to do to make this happen and you have to be realistic um all those things that you want to do are possible otherwise it would never have happened to anyone but it doesn't mean that you know it's going to happen overnight and it doesn't mean that someone else can wave a magic wand to make it happen for you because even some of the best execs the best managers the best marketers can't make something work if it's just not going to work It's, it's no one's fault actually at all like sometimes there are people at fault when there's you know 
untoward things happen but the majority of time people actually do want good, people want good things for people generally and people want good things to happen to good people so you know it's 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 about identifying the things within you that you can do to to take yourself forward and just understand that you can't always take well you will never probably be able to take yourself out of the business entirely and if that's um your mindset then you need to shift away from that because it's unlikely that you'll ever just be able to be a full-time musician because the person the people that will be supporting it the people that need to be around you to be able to sustain that as a career is are a lot more people than you think and you'll be paid a lot more salary than you mm. might ever mm. imagine mm. <laughs> actually so that's my mindset shift it took me a while to get there but I think that's the mindset shift like that's no that's really great and I I hope that that empowers a lot of people listening to think right I actually I need to be resourceful in my skill set and I need to see this as the long game and I need to see that you know it needs to be some kind of profitable business and when I say profitable as in you can pay the bills on it Mm -hmm. and and that I can shift that and pivot that in time more and more and you know closer and closer to whatever that end goal might be and probably that end goal is going to change because you'll learn so much from you know, approaching it in that way. And, you know, maybe that is writing and producing for sync at home. Maybe it's making the music for podcasts and radio. Maybe it's like you say, putting on live events and you're just really good at that and you can make that profitable. It, it's, um, it's about kind of looking at what you also know you, you could lend your skills and your talents to. And then I think the really tricky thing is then balancing as well as that, your, your craft, mm-hmm. your creative mm-hmm. practice mm-hmm. and, being aware that you know that will ebb and flow but that also keeping your sights on it still mm-hmm, completely you know, and it's not easy it's not easy that's why I say I, I have like 95 percent so that 95 percent of the time that I spend doing things I don't like doing is really supporting that five percent of my time where I get to do the things that I love to do and that makes the 95 percent so much easier because at least with that 95 percent it's still working on the things that support that 5% of my time. Eventually, I'd like to get to a point where it doesn't, it's, it's more 50 50, and I'm actually not spending so much time doing things that I don't enjoy. And I'm spending so much more time doing the things that I want to. But I see that as a, as a, that is my goal. Like that's where my goal is now. It's not, it's not a specific thing anymore. It's like, what do I love doing? How can I make it so that I'm doing something that sets me up to be able to do what I love doing more often? Well, it's an investment, isn't it? All this time you're putting in right now is an investment so that you then have more of that balance later on. But then you have to be you have to be focused on that so that you do get there. And mm-hmm. that's where it's that kind of almost like a um, paradox in a way. You, know, you have to be very, very focused, but then at the same time open and um, a little bit more philosophical. So, yeah, well... Thank you so much, Vanessa, for coming on the podcast. Before we finish up, I just want to ask um, if people want to find out more about Cact- Cactus City, how do they find out more and get involved? And also, are there any things coming up for Cactus City over the next um, you know, few months that we should know about? Sure. Um, so I suppose it depends when this episode is coming out. Um, we've got an event uh, next month at the head office of Wolf and Badger. So they've got like a flagship store. So that'll be an open mic night. However, we are going to curate artists and um, they will be paid again. We were really key on that. But if you want to find Cactus City, it's at Cactus City UK is all the um, all the social handles. And then the website's cactuscity.org. So it's really easy to um, remember. So yeah, and what else is coming up? Well, hopefully this year we'll be working on... Um, an open call for producers to come in and learn some new skills and also be nurtured with some publishers to actually getting them into regular paid sync works, et cetera, right. working on dynamic music, understanding how to make trailer music. That's one of the, the key projects that we're working on this year. Hopefully start in June. Depends on um, where funding is flowing from, but that's the, that's the plan for this year. Very cool. Great. Well, I will have my eyes on all of that. That sounds wonderful. And just thank you so much for coming on, sharing your experience and also just your wonderful words of wisdom. It's been wonderful to chat. Thank you so much. Okay, full disclosure, dear listener, I could talk to Vanessa all day, but I obviously had to let her get back to all the thousands of things on her to do list. Hard as it is to imagine, there is life outside of girls twiddling knobs. 
I know, who knew? But I guess there's a couple of takeaways I just want to summarise here from what Vanessa shared today. Firstly, I loved how she spoke about reframing success as a musician. Trust me, I'd much rather work with a manager who had that conversation with me at the beginning of our relationship than the big red flag, I'm going to make you famous one. But we can also start working on this ourselves. It's okay to have big, bold goals, but also have a handle on the things that will actually move our music forward on a personal level day to day. And hint, it won't be how many Instagram followers you have. I also loved how she talked about approaching your music from a place of compassion and love rather than fear. If you've been hoping that your music taking off will be the thing that takes away all those pesky feelings of anxiety, failure, loneliness or whatever else, you're wrong. It's much better to come at music from a place of stability and strength in the first place and you'll be much more likely to see fulfilling opportunities follow. And lastly, don't overlook the admin side of your music. This is the fine print stuff around getting your music properly registered with royalty societies so that any money owed to you is being collected. And as Vanessa mentioned, it's also a good idea to find out about publishing your music in general. And I've linked to some helpful resources that will get you started with this in the show notes. Whatever you do, don't pin all your hopes and dreams on one musical outcome. Explore different revenue streams so you have a solid foundation from which to build your career as a musician for the long term. Or don't, but take Vanessa's advice and be prepared that this might mean working a nine to five or something else to allow you this luxury. Believe me, dear listener, if this is a source of contention for you, I get it. All of this has been a dialogue inside my own head as an artist my whole adult life. I say this from a place of love and understanding. And that's another episode and another season all wrapped up, Knob Twiddlers. If you haven't done so already, make sure you listen back to all the amazing episodes we have from past seasons of the podcast. There's enough there to keep you company till season four arrives. And make sure you join me inside the Girls Twiddling Knobs podcast community too, so we can keep in touch till then. And if you're a long-term listener to the podcast, I just want to say a massive thank you for tuning in to Girls Twiddling Knobs. It's really quite amazing to see the community around this podcast grow, and that the conversations we've had are touching the hearts of people of all genders and from all walks of life. I also want to say a huge thank you to this season's guests, Emily Nash, Gazelle Twin, a.k.a. Elizabeth Bernholtz, Jessica Paz, Melissa U. Parker, Flaming June, a.k.a. Louise Etock, Sam Crane, Annie Ball, Sandy Ince, Zenon Peeler, Jenny Bull Craig, Charlie Deacon Davies, and of course today's guest, Vanessa Threadgold. You are all doing amazing, trailblazing work in music, and it's been an honour to feature your voices on the podcast. Also, a big thank you to this season's sponsors, Isotope. It means a lot for a small independent podcast like ours to have the backing and support of one of the most respected music production software companies out there, and also to be able to offer our listeners a cracking deal on their plugins too. Thank you also to Jade Bailey, the podcast's assistant producer, without whom I would struggle under the pure weight of creating, editing and delivering each episode. And finally, thank you also to Francesca O'Connor, who each week organises the show notes and social media buzz that keeps the podcast accessible for all of you lovely listeners. OK, I think that's just about me over and out, Knob Twiddlers. But remember, never apologise for getting started. Your music is worth taking seriously and you are worth respect. I'll catch you in season four. Girls Twiddling Knobs is hosted and produced by me, Isabel Anderson, with production support from Jade Bailey. The show notes are compiled by Francesca O'Connor, and this is a female DIY musician production. Just one final thing, dear listener. I just wanted to ask what you thought of today's episode. Did you love it? Did it make you feel emotions and stuff? 
Did it give you a whole new philosophy on the meaning of life? No? Okay, well, fair enough. But if you liked it at all, just share a teeny weeny review wherever you're listening because, number one, my ego likes a massage and, more importantly, two, I can learn what you're loving and want more of. Oh, and three, it'll boost our ranking in the podcast algorithm, meaning more women and girls will hear all this girls twiddling knobs goodness. Triple win. I can't wait to read your review.